Emmanuel Charpentier. Now I'd like to hand over to Emmanuel, who's joining us from Berlin. As you know, she is the 2020 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry for her work on the development of the CRISPR technology for gene editing. And it's that story of how she how that development happened and her own journey that she is going to tell us about now. So, Emmanuel, welcome and over to you. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today and to present you um, the research that has uh, led to the, indeed, the Nobel Prize in 2020. I would like to warmly uh, thank the Nobel Prize outreach, AstraZeneca, and for sure you, your university, University of Sharjah. I, I have difficulties to most like I'm not pronouncing it very well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to, um, to uh, explain you um, the journey in, in, in my um, regard <laughs> that has uh, started uh, actually uh, during my PhD uh, studies uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, about 30 years ago. And I just say this because it's it's important uh, in the sense that uh, the story that has developed into the so-called CRISPR and discover it, it, it's really a, a mixture of a lot of uh, various projects that uh, I have been uh, working on throughout my career. And also it's a mix of, of different types of inspirations and ideas and that I've uh, developed uh, over the years. And this uh, story actually started in, in my laboratory uh, in uh, Vienna at the Max Peretz uh, Laboratories in um, 2006, uh, where we were already interested in uh, in understanding how a human pathogen and uh, caused called the Streptococcus pathogenes can cause diseases in, in humans. Uh, we have always been interested in. Um, in uh, understanding the, the really the basic mechanisms of, of bacterial uh, virulence. Uh, Streptococcus pathogenes, it's a so-called gram-positive pathogen. It's a strict human pathogen. Uh, can only uh, colonize and, and infect uh, humans. Can cause a large variety of diseases, ranging from mild diseases to more severe diseases, uh, specifically infecting the skin and the throat. Among the more severe diseases, you have necrotizing fasciitis or toxic shock syndrome, uh, which are actually known to also be caused uh, thanks to, or thanks, I don't know whether it's thanks, but it's <laughs> uh, with the help of, of certain virulence factors that are encoded on mobile genetic elements uh, that are called uh, bacteriophages, and that can, uh, are viruses of bacteria, that can infect uh, bacteria, so uh, Streptococcus pathogenes, and can enter uh, a cycle whereby uh, the, the phage upon infection of, of the bacterium can insert its uh, uh, own genome on the genome of the, of the bacterial cell and in a way bring uh, new, uh, new traits. And a particularity of Streptococcus pathogenes is that those, those viruses actually carry uh, virulence factors, uh, virulence genes, including virulence factors, that uh, then Streptococcus pathogenes is using to cause more severe diseases. So um, I guess you may be familiar with SARS-CoV-2 and the evolution of, of the virus. So in bacteria, it's uh, exactly the same thing. Uh, even for strict human pathogen, they undergo uh, a very large uh, evolution among clinical isolates. Uh, with a diversity of, of uh, virulence genes, which they acquire uh, through mobile genetic elements and through viruses that are infecting them. And so we have always been interested in, in uh, understanding how the pathogen causes diseases in humans and also to a certain extent how humans defend itself uh, against uh, uh, Streptococcus pathogenes. Uh, for, for me, I mean, during my career, it was uh, always clear starting at the Pasteur Institute in France that working on bacterial pathogens offer in terms of applications two, two aspects of application. So uh, I've started my, my research on, on um, uh, resistance to uh, on understanding the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. 
and also in uh, actually uh, struggling and trying to develop genetic tools that would allow to uh, study in a more precise and a more also easy way uh, the, the pathogens. Uh, having said this, it also uh, became uh, clear when I started um, my postdocs uh, in the US that when one works on, uh, on a strict human pathogen, one is always limited in terms of the type of experiments that one can do uh, with regard to the host pathogen interaction. So that's why uh, uh, even 30 years ago, uh, scientists were using more mouse models as a, a model organism to, to study the interaction, even though for sure it, it's not the, the best model to use for a strict human pathogen. So on the way, there was also humanized uh, mouse models developed. Uh, but a, a need to really perform genetics in, in human cells and in organisms that are really uh, the interactors with uh, the bacteria of interest. And this, it was clear that there was a, a lack in, in, uh, in precise genetic tools to, to perform the genetics. And so along those lines, there was always a wish for me to do research. Uh, I've always been interested in microbiology, in uh, in pathogens, uh, these microbes causing uh, nasty uh, diseases. But on the way, it was always uh, an interest and an understanding that working on specifically focusing on the fundamental aspects and the deep uh, mechanistics, which I have developed over uh, my uh, own career as a head of a lab where I could do, maybe I could focus on on what uh, I, I thought I, I should focus on. So I really want more deeply and more mechanistic. And with the understanding that this was essential, this basic science to find, um, so the idea was uh, to find mechanisms that could uh, lead to new uh, therapeutic uh, strategies, whether it would be to find a new target for a new antibiotic, or whether it would be to find a, a new target or a new mechanism that could uh, uh, somehow um, benefit the development of other types of, of therapeutic strategies to to fight bacterial infections. Second, there was also um, the understanding that uh, this type of, of, of research or so could lead to new genetic tools because people working on, on bacteria over the past uh, 50, 60 years have understood that uh, this is bacteria and viruses are a large source of, of enzymes and proteins that have been harnessed uh, over the past 50 years for, for molecular biology purposes. And that all the genetics that uh, we have in, uh, that we are using in the laboratories in biology, uh, starting with cloning, with uh, the ability to amplify the DNA, to clone the DNA, uh, to recombine the DNA, all those, uh, those ways of, of dealing and, and working with DNA involve technologies that really originate from research on bacteria and viruses with uh, those organisms having been a large source of, of really uh, uh, enzymes and, and that, uh, that have really revolutionized uh, uh, molecular biology. Um, now, having said this, um, I was for sure um, also with the idea that focusing on host pathogen interactions, maybe along the way would uh, lead me to, uh, if, if Streptococcus pathogenes would be uh, a, new, a new, <laughs> or a source of a, of a new um, mechanism that could be harnessed as a new genetic tool, uh, to try also to see whether this genetic tool would, uh, would be useful to perform genetics, not only in bacteria, but also beyond bacteria in higher organisms such as human. Terms. So this has always been the, the line of, of my research. Now in my lab, we started um, with different, studying different types of, of mechanisms, uh, focusing on specifically uh, regulation of gene expression. So Streptococcus pathogenes, like uh, any other bacteria, are encountering diverse stresses in the, in the human host, such as uh, heat shock, cold shock, uh, acid stress, and other types of stresses. And they're encountering a lot of different molecules that are produced uh, in the human host, and they have to survive and, and cause, obviously, diseases. This is their interest. Their interest is also to persist. 
uh, not only to cause uh, diseases right away, but also to persist uh, and the human host to be able to fight back at some point. And so a large number of molecules are involved of protein nature, RNA nature, so lots of metabolites, peptides, etc. And all those production of, of uh, RNAs, proteins that are important for uh, virulence and fitness of the bacteria, uh, their expression have to be, um, has to be regulated in a, in a sp special way. So depending on, on where the, the bacteria finds itself in the, in the body, but also in a temporal fashion. Uh, so depending on, on the growth of the bacteria, this, all this uh, expression of, of factors uh, will be um, regulated in a, in a different way. There is an interest for the, the bacteria upon colonization to, to um, how do you say, express certain types of factors. And when they become invasive and really enter the body, et cetera, to express uh, other factors. So we have been tackling uh, these uh, issues with by focusing on different types of mechanisms, including mechanisms that would involve the so-called small regulatory RNAs. So small regulatory RNAs enter into uh, this uh, specific uh, dogma whereby uh, the DNA are transcribed into messenger RNA that is translated into proteins or so thanks to other types of RNAs, such as transfer RNAs or ribosomal RNAs. And you have another class of, of RNAs that in, in bacteria are called uh, non-coding RNAs or small regulatory RNAs. In eukaryotes, they are called macro RNAs. Uh, small interfering RNAs and um, other types of, of nomenclature that have been used as well. And their particularity in bacteria is that they are relatively small, they don't code for a protein, and they can interact directly with the messenger RNA or directly with the proteins by changing the stability of the messenger RNA or the, the ability of the messenger RNA to be translated into proteins, or they can also interact with proteins and, and change their, their function. So either block their function or activate their function. So this uh, research on small RNAs in bacteria started in uh, the beginning of the 80s. This was actually the discovery that uh, in bacteria that RNAs could have regulatory uh, functions. When we started to work on, on uh, the, the, the small regulatory RNAs, the idea was to search for small regulatory RNAs in streptococcus pyogenes. We were already working on some of them, but we wanted to know more. And specifically, we were interested in finding a, a new mechanism of interaction. And what was missing at the time was actually a small RNA that will not interact with RNA and proteins, but that will interact with DNA. And this is what CRISPR brought, actually. And here I just want to, to show you the CRISPR technology, and I will tell you after briefly uh, how we came to, to this uh, technology. So CRISPR-Cas technology, it's really a, a technology that makes use of of uh, an RNA molecule that is bound to a, a protein. So what you see on, on the slide is a target DNA in black, and that will be uh, site-specifically recognized by the CRISPR-Cas uh, machinery. And uh, this CRISPR-Cas machinery works in such a way that the RNA molecule is programmed and to base pair uh, site-specifically to the target DNA of interest. There is base pairing going on, so it's in a way a way to, to find the the, the, the right uh, uh, site on, on the DNA to be uh, transformed. And then the, the enzyme Cas9 that is bound to the, to the RNA uh, will then cleave uh, the DNA molecule. And uh, upon cleavage, uh, specifically in higher organisms, repair machineries of the cells uh, are triggered. And this would allow the, the, the repair of the target uh, DNA in the sense that um, um, the repair machineries will, will repair the DNA, but it can do it in uh, different ways, uh, depending on how uh, the tool CRISPR-Cas will be designed. So either it can actually um, introduce a mutation on the DNA site specifically, or change, uh, correct a mutation, or uh, exchange a piece of DNA by another piece of DNA, or delete a piece of DNA or a couple of, of, of base pairs. So this is the way it works. And the beauty of this mechanism is that it's programmable through the RNA. So one just needs to, to change the RNA and to then uh, introduce uh, site specifically and, and edit uh, to edit site specifically a target uh, DNA. So um, this it's it's a tool also that is not the only tool. 
uh, important in genetics, but roughly just to give you an idea where it stands in the history of, of genetics. So the 19th century and the, the first part of, of the 20th century uh, have been key for for really a discovery with regard to fundamental genetics. Uh, with the origin of, of, of species, with Darwin, Mandel, with the laws of inheritance and the DNA that was isolated, uh, shown to be the carrier of genetic information, the structure of the DNA that was uh, determined, and the genetic code that was deciphered. Then for sure, uh, as I said, uh, starting in the, in the 60s, uh, the understanding that bacteria and viruses were uh, a large source of enzymes that then were really harnessed in what we call the start of molecular biology, with the ability to have enzymes that can cleave the DNA, so restriction enzymes used for cloning, uh, enzymes that can ligate the DNA, so uh, different enzymes that would allow to recombine the DNA, to also uh, reverse transcribe the, the, the DNA, to amplify the DNA. Then the specific gene targeting technologies uh, started to appear in uh, 2000s uh, with uh, engineering of a um, specific uh, nucleases, so engineered artificially, but based on, on criteria of natural nucleases. So this is where these engineered nucleases were zinc finger and talent nucleases. Uh, they work the same way uh, than CRISPR-Cas, the same way when I say is that they target site specifically DNA and they cleave the DNA, but they use a mechanism that is different, uh, whereby it's more protein based, it's one protein and the, the code that allows a protein to recognize a certain sequence of interest on the DNA is actually uh, programmed through uh, within the protein. So uh, it worked uh, well, but for sure CRISPR through the RNA programmability and also the easy or uh, um, more e easy way to, to design the, the tools and also uh, the, the multiple versions that I have, uh, that have uh, evolved uh, since uh, Really, the start of, of CRISPR-Cas have offered a lot of um, possibilities for um, uh, really um, targeted um, 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 genome engineering and editing. So the story started, as I said, in our interest in the lab in 2006 in finding new small regulatory RNAs in Streptococcus pyogenes. And we found an RNA that we call tracer RNA for trans-activating uh, CRISPR RNA. This is the name we, we, we gave to this RNA when we understood uh, its role. And uh, this RNA we showed could be expressed in uh, very nicely in Streptococcus biogenes in a constitutive manner throughout growth. This is a northern blood analysis that is indicated. And that this RNA was expressed in different forms. What was very specific to this uh, RNA is that we thought initially that it would regulate uh, a virulence factor, the expression of a virulence factor in s pyogenes until we figured out that this was not uh, really uh, the main role of, of this RNA. But more importantly, this RNA was encoded uh, by um, a, a piece of DNA that was located in the vicinity of a system that was highlighted at the time to be a CRISPR system, so composed of protein and RNA. And this is how we came to CRISPR. So CRISPR was known at the time. Huh? A lot of scientists have, have started to work on CRISPR, discovering uh, certain signatures of the CRISPR system in the, in the 80s and then in the 90s uh, and, and 2000s, understanding that this system was actually a different system that would allow bacteria to defend themselves against viruses. So uh, bacteria can um, encounter a lot of mobile genetic elements, plasmids, transposons, viruses. If I focus on the viruses, there are those viruses, bacteriophages that can kill the bacteria or those that can bring new uh, threats to the bacteria by integrating their genome into the genome of the bacteria. But in principle, the bacteria defend themselves, uh, you know, like any organism against uh, an external threat. And uh, so they have different uh, immune systems. Restriction modification uh, systems uh, uh, is uh, one of the different systems existing and has led to the discovery of this uh, restriction modification of these restriction enzymes that have been uh, um, used for cloning. And uh, CRISPR is, is specific because it's an adaptive immune system. Uh, so I'm not going to enter into the details, which will be a bit complicated and for the sake of time. But this is what is important to understand compared to innate immunity that is just a basic defense here. 
the uh, adaptation of the system implies that uh, the, the bacteria have to encounter a first time a virus to uh, integrate into uh, the, 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 the genome of, of CRISPR, so the, the CRISPR system, pieces of, of this virus, uh, of this viral DNA. And then the species of viral DNA that have been incorporated at the level of the CRISPR array on the genome of the bacteria will work as somehow um, memorization uh, tools to be able to recognize the virus upon a second infection. And those memorized sequences are transcribed into these CRISPR RNAs that associate with CRISPR associated proteins to then recognize uh, the viral DNA. And when we uh, started to work on, on the CRISPR-Cas9, uh, we figured out that the community had tackled already quite well the mechanisms of other types of CRISPR because it's a largely evolving system. And that Cas9 was different because instead of a complex of proteins involved to recognize uh, the DNA, there was only one protein involved. And then we came to uh, the understanding that this tracer RNA molecule that we had uh, discovered was indeed uh, interacting with a CRISPR RNA. So in contrast to other systems, you did not have one RNA molecule and different proteins, but you had a, a duplex of RNA, CRISPR RNA, tracer RNA, that is bound to the protein Cas9 that can recognize that specifically the viral DNA. And the idea was to link uh, those two RNA molecules that are also can be used without a, a linker and then to program uh, this RNA molecule to be able to recognize any DNA of interest and therefore lead to uh, this technology that is called CRISPR-Cas9. So again, this technology, the particularity of this technology is that it has been picked up by uh, the scientists uh, extremely fast. So when we published our article in Science in, in 2012, um, right away uh, scientists have jumped on the technology and to try to see whether indeed it could facilitate uh, the genetics uh, in um, diverse organisms and very fast uh, after six months you could see publications uh, coming up showing that the technology is indeed effective in genome editing and engineering in plants in uh, drosophila in fish in, in in mice or in different types of model organisms in organoids and specifically in human cells um with regard to uh, the evolution um I will maybe show you this slide first. So the CRISPR-Cas has evolved in, in a large um, um, amount of, of systems over the millions of years, uh, to considering the harms race of, of bacteria and, and, uh, and CRISPR-Cas uh, and, and phages and also mobile genetic elements. I have to say that CRISPR-Cas is not only present in bacteria, it's also present in archaea. But to make a long story short, it has largely evolved and the classification has, uh, has uh, appeared. Uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system is on the left and it's uh, the type 2 system. And at the time when we started to work on it, there were only three types of, of CRISPR-Cas9. No, now there are uh, six types with uh, two uh, families mainly. But uh, the beauty of the system is that even if you consider the CRISPR-Cas9 system, it has largely evolved. Uh, the protein Cas9 is, is of different sequence nature, uh, depending on uh, the bacterial source. There are some domains that are conserved. Uh, for sure, the specificity and the mechanism is conserved, but the sequence of this protein is uh, largely um, evolving. The same for the RNAs. And I just say this because this is by uh, looking at, uh, at really at the diversity of sequences of this system among the different bacterial species that uh, we came in my lab to understand what will be really uh, the specificity of the system and, and the conservation of, of the mechanism. Uh, and also to highlight a new class of RNA, the, the tracer RNA, that is not in contrast to other RNAs, uh, not defined by a conservation in sequence or structure, but defined by the fact that this uh, tracer RNA has the capacity to base pair with the CRISPR RNA that is part of the uh, CRISPR machinery and lead to a, a very nice, uh, easy tool. So there are large applications of, of the technology, uh, as uh, you may know, uh, doing uh, genetics and more precisely for sure uh, uh, can offer and offers uh, 
large perspective with regard to the production of clean plant crops, uh, whereby the idea is to uh, reproduce uh, changes that can be found in nature uh, without having plants that carry any longer uh, foreign genetic element that would have been uh, uh, the, the consequence of using other types of, of genetic tools that have been used in the past. Uh, it's extremely transformative in, in research and development in the sense that it accelerates the possibility to engineer uh, different um, uh, uh, genetically uh, modified uh, organisms for the purpose of, of research. It also in research and, and development uh, um, gives a totally new perspective with regard to uh, screens that are done in human cells or other types of organisms, uh, specifically in, in therapeutics to find uh, new targets for therapeutics or to create models that allow to accelerate also uh, the, the testing of new therapeutics in, uh, in uh, certain types of, of diseases. Um, it, has really, really boosted a lot uh, this research. And uh, having said this, it's also interesting because the CRISPR-Cas te technology actually has been also um, key to, um, in the sense to show that our technology can also evolve fast. So, and develop, uh, be being developed uh, extremely fast over the past 10 years, uh, for sure the scientists starting with really the version 1.0 that was not so much uh, different than what nature could offer. Um, the trick was um, relatively um, um, minimal, yet uh, there was a kind of, of trick uh, to, <laughs> to be able to use it uh, in, uh, in human cells. But then for sure, uh, this technology has evolved into different types of versions, also combining the CRISPR-Cas technology with other uh, new genetic technologies that uh, were used actually in the past or that have been discovered uh, since CRISPR-Cas. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is one um, CRISPR-Cas technology. Uh, other types of CRISPR-Cas that have been discovered uh, since 2015 have been also harnessed uh, for uh, enlarging the, the genetic toolbox. Uh, an important aspect is in medicine because um, the idea of a genetic tool that is precise as CRISPR-Cas9 is for sure. The idea of combining it as a gene editing tool to cell therapy and to be able to, to bring, uh, an, uh, let's say, uh, an attractive tool for, for uh, all the treatments of diseases that are combining uh, cell therapy with uh, genome editing to, to treat uh, diseases that have a genetic uh, component as, as a cause. And um, for sure as well, the, the challenge of uh, developing the technology as a direct uh, medicine uh, that could be directly uh, um, injected into um, you know, the patient. So there, there is also research going on in this uh, um, era. So um, this is an electron microscopy picture of Streptococcus pargenes uh, that uh, are formed as oxide. Um, just to say that actually in my laboratory, we, we mainly work on different aspects of Streptococcus pergenes. We work a little bit less on, on CRISPR in our days. I figured out that the entire planet has, has been working on CRISPR and, and uh, has uh, progressed uh, tremendously. So uh, also just uh, in conclusion to mention that lots of people have been working on CRISPR, the, the uh, impact of the scientific community, not only the scientific community, but also all the researchers working in biotech and industry and in applied research around CRISPR have done a tremendous job. Also, I would like to thank all the, the pioneers of CRISPR because, as I said, a lot of scientists were working on CRISPR when we uh, jump into the boat. And for sure, I would like to thank my institutions because I've been a mobile international scientist. The study started in Vienna. Um, then the main part was done when I was at Umeå University in Sweden, and I moved to Braunschweig in Germany, and I'm now in Berlin. And I would like to thank uh, the members of my team. Uh, I've always worked with uh, extremely talented and uh, motivated young scientists. I would like to thank specifically Christoph Shilinski and Elitza Delcheva for this project, and my collaborators, the group of Jörg Vogel, of Eugenie Kunin, and uh, surely uh, Jennifer Dorner. And...
and uh, this is uh, the institute that I have um, uh, founded uh, together with the Max Planck Society three years ago, and that is called the Max Planck Unit for the Science of Pathogens, and that is based in Berlin, Germany. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you so very much, Emmanuel. It was um, uh, a really rare insight into the way um, a scientist works to hear you put your work in the context of history and also your own inquisitiveness, the, your own, your own, the way you started by describing how you thought about the questions you were addressing was really fascinating and special. So thank you very much indeed. There was a great deal encompassed in a short talk, beautifully presented. Thank you. So questions have been coming in, uh, flooding in from our online audience. And I know we have questions in the auditorium as well. Let me jump straight in with one from uh, Dr. Ma Maram Al-Harasi, which has been sent in online. After 2012, when the CRISPR publication happened, that everything exploded. But before then, what challenges did you face in publishing your research and how did you overcome them? Uh, challenges to publish my research in general. Hmm. Uh, are actually, interestingly speaking, <laughs> the the two easiest papers I ever published were uh, the papers behind this discovery uh, in nature and in science. Actually, I should um, correct myself. Uh, when we um, submitted uh, the paper in nature to Nature, actually, journal, and this was with... Uh, um, my first collaborator, Jörg Vogel, and we submitted the paper and after a month, we, we did not hear anything. So I contacted again the, the, the editors and then it seemed like the, the paper has not, was sitting on the desk of, of the editor and then he changed the editor and then, um, and also because I was told that maybe, you know, the, the story was not really clearly, uh, it was a little bit novel, maybe, and they didn't know whether the editor for RNA biology should take it or for microbiology. And at the end of the day, it went to microbiology. But having said this, uh, then after it was uh, easy going, uh, just because this story was really, uh, at least from my side, really in my lab, done 100% uh, if, if it's not 150% correct, because I had understood that this was a story of my life. So I, I wanted to have everything extremely perfect and that uh, no one could criticize and that we were really sure about the, the mechanism. Uh, and because the story was really uh, clear, I mean, this mechanism is really working wonderfully. Now, uh, most of my research has been a little bit more different. When you work on, on the regulation of virulence factors, it's often not, you know, black and white. It's often uh, gray what uh, you... <laughs> you would describe. Gray in the sense that uh, the, the results you get are the results you get, but when you work with bacteria, you know that what you describe uh, may apply for a certain clinical isolate grown under specific conditions, but uh, the story may be different with another clinical isolate grown under uh, different conditions. I mean, you have seen this with SARS-CoV-2. These are largely evolving uh, macroorganisms and in a way, there is really a subtlety of mechanism. So when you describe a, a mechanism, it's true, but it's true maybe at a certain moment for a clinical isolate, another clinical isolate may, uh, may react a little bit differently. And so uh, in this type of, of research, it was a little bit more difficult to publish because there will always be some, uh, you know, reviewers <laughs> of the a little bit a challenge. So it was... Uh, uh, actually, very interestingly, at the beginning of, of uh, my research really on bacterial virulence in the mid-90s, it seems like the macrobiologists themselves had difficulties to really uh, um, integrate the fact that uh, there is this evolution and that, uh, you know, maybe their clinical isolate may have a different phenotype. It doesn't mean that mm -hmm. what, uh, you know, one team described is wrong. So, and, and for uh, also publications, I have to say, as a macrobiologist, you're very unlucky because this is not um, historically, this is not a field of research that, you know, is so much of interest for uh, journals like Nature and Science. Mm -hmm. So That's... if you're a structural biologist, you can easily publish in those journals. If you're a cell biologist or cancer biologist, microbiologist, it's a bit different. 
That's very interesting. And it's a bit ironic, really, given all the tools that get supplied to everybody else from microbiology. Yeah. Yeah, so um, let, let me, I know we have questions from the auditorium. We have lots of questions to get through and not too much time. So let's, um, let's go to the auditorium and see if we can get a question. Can we have a question from the auditorium, please? Thank you. This is Professor Mahasne from Department of Applied Biology. I welcome you here in Sharjah. Despite the distance between Sharjah and Berlin, I can assure you that uh, my student in microbial uh, genetics course, they uh, have adopted this technology since the last six years. So they are following up your steps on, on this technology. So the question is, what's your future perspectives on using this technology as a, an alternative strategy against the multi-resistant bacteria, particularly when we talk about the Staphylococcus aureus or epidermis as the leading causative agents of the uh, hospital acquired infection. A plus also, what's your future perspective on use of this technology on some of the familial genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, hyperclostremia, and so on. Those, as you know, are associated with the familial and with the a human genealogical lineage. Thank you. Okay. So uh, for the first question, uh, actually, uh, Ciliano CRISPR-Cas originates from from um, from bacteria, but uh, it, it it's more useful as the technology for genetics in uh, in uh, in higher organisms. However, there were um, um, some strategy is sought that uh, with regard to um, fighting antibiotic um, um, resistance, uh, the presence of antibiotic resistant genes in bacteria, thanks to CRISPR-Cas. Um, there are some studies that were actually uh, published initially by David Bika when he was in Luciano Maraf in Islam, and he has a, a company actually in France uh, for this strategy. The idea is actually uh, to deliver uh, the CRISPR-Cas uh, system through actually a um, type of, of tools like uh, stage delivery uh, system and CRISPR-Cas that uh, will be able to uh, target uh, gene, um, uh, genes encoding antibiotic resistance. And the reason why it's because in bacteria, if you use a CRISPR-Cas system to target DNA, the DNA will be cleaved. And the repair mechanisms in the bacteria are way weaker than in higher organisms. So it will not be repaired. So in a way, if, if you target uh, your DNA and your uh, with CRISPR-Cas, the DNA will be cleaved, cannot be repaired, and this is the dead end of the bacteria. Uh, so the idea was to, to develop in a way uh, this strategy. Now, for sure, the issue with bacteria, but this is not uh, associated to CRISPR-Cas, but inherent to any uh, uh, development of, of antibiotic, uh, um, uh, how do you say, therapeutic uh, strategies is always the delivery. The delivery is always uh, the, 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 the problem, you know, how to target uh, the right uh, bacteria in the body with uh, such a delivery system. But uh, this is in development. I, I have no idea whether this will really come with, uh, with really a, a product one day. Now, with regard to sickle cell anemia, uh, there are some patients that uh, are now have been uh, cured and uh, are do not need a, a, you know, a blood transfusion and they have been cured so uh, at least uh, uh, one of the of the first patients to be cured with this technology was uh, a technology so developed by um, CRISPR therapeutics a company that I have uh, co-founded and that is based in uh, Boston Cambridge that I have co-founded with Rodger Novak and, and Sean Foy. And uh, they have now patients who are uh, who have been in a way uh, uh, treated through the combination of cell therapy and gene editing with CRISPR. And so there has been at some point a, a cell replacement. And so far, uh, they don't uh, need to, to undergo this uh, very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not pleasant um, uh, treatment that is was before to always uh, you know, go through, uh, um, yes, yeah, through um, um, changes of, of of 
of, of the blood and transfusion. So it's, uh, it's, it's um, I guess, some examples of how the technology can be used to treat uh, blood genetic disorders. So, thank you very much indeed for the question, and thank you, Emmanuel, for the answer. Let's go to the auditorium again. Do we have another question? Perhaps from a student? Regarding the DNA repair pathway that is used in gene editing, and uh, as we all know that, in, especially in cancer, there is uh, some deficiency in these pathways that are in homologous and joining or the homologous direction. So my question is, is it taking a consideration for the future direction of CRISPR-Cas9 that could be that there is an, another alternative way to edit genome instead of depending on this endogenous uh, DNA repair pathway, as I mentioned, because it could be deficient in some in, uh, of the cancer cells. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. This is uh, indeed an uh, excellent point. Um, and, and for sure, this is taken into consideration. Now, the, the, let's put it with easy to say that CRISPR-Cas is a technology and that it's working well, but uh, it's working well uh, thanks to also a lot of, of progress and that uh, has been done by uh, different uh, scientists who have tackled those issues in the sense that um, specifically in the human body, for sure, you have diverse types of cells, which implies that the CRISPR-Cas technology has to be associated with different types of delivery tools that are different depending on the different types of cells to be targeted. Then for sure, the cells react uh, differently to the, to the DNA uh, cut that is triggered by CRISPR-Cas or the DNA modification, because sometimes CRISPR-Cas is also targeted to, to cut only one single strand of the DNA or just uh, um, bind the DNA. So for sure, the cells will also react differently because they have different types of repair pathways. So that's why the design of the technology is always according to uh, the type of, of cells. And if one uh, wants to, to develop the technology as a direct medicine, also where those cells uh, uh, are located in, in, in the body. So, um, and I have to say that this allows me nevertheless to say to which extent uh, the technology CRISPR-Cas has benefited from uh, the tremendous uh, developments that we have witnessed over the past uh, 15, 20 years. And that is all the developments of, of gene, um, uh, genetic engineering and gene editing with uh, the, the development of uh, a large panel now of delivery tools. So all the pioneers also of gene therapy uh, have led to a lot of discoveries that have benefited when CRISPR came um, on, in play to really uh, associate CRISPR-Cas with all these gene, um, gene uh, delivery tools and also the ability to, uh, to sequence the DNA in a deep fashion, which is also important for cancer research, also with regard to research and development when it is uh, to, to test uh, uh, um, you know, outside the, the patient in research development, what can be done with CRISPR and, and cancer cells to develop also uh, clinically this, uh, you know, organoids at the organoid level or cell level, this uh, cancer models to be able to find new targets for therapeutics or test therapeutics in development. And, and this again, as you said, it's uh, the knowledge of the repair pathway is essential and this is taken into consideration. So, uh, the idea to maybe also supplement the CRISPR-Cas system with additional proteins that could, you know, help the, the repair mechanisms. Thank you. Fascinating discussion. And we have another question from the auditorium. So, Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is really a very inspiring journey. And uh, thank you for, you know, this initiative and giving the lecture at the University of Sharjah. So my name is Talib. I'm from the College of Pharmacy, University of Sharjah. So as you know, one of the emerging and hot topics nowadays in drug discovery is the ProTac technology, where people try to really design molecules to bind to one of the E3 ligases from one side, tethered with another part, where it binds to a protein so that then the uh, E3 ligase is recruited to cleave one of the proteins that are considered as, you know, related or associated to certain disease. Now, my crazy question is, 
is it possible, for example, to combine the CRISPR-Cas9 in a way to knock down one of the E3 ligases or even enhance the production of one of the ligases that's associated with certain disease or that's just like a fantasy? Thank you very much. Um, this, no, thank you very much for bringing this uh, very interesting uh, topic. Um, I would believe it is uh, it is possible. Now I, I do not know to which extent this will impact other other functions in the cell to target the E three ligase, um, and and also with regard to to the fact that um, you know for sure when you target uh, if it's not for research purposes. <laughs> There is always a question uh, whether one would like to do it through, you know, a combination of gene editing and cell therapy with cell replacement, whether the idea will be to, to uh, try to develop the technology to target the, the E3 ligase directly in the patient. Now, I'm, I'm not a, a specialist of E3 ligase, but I, I just don't know to which extent uh, uh, targeting the E3 ligase, whether it will be to downregulate or, or over uh, express the ligase will impact uh, uh, you know other mechanisms but I would not see why uh, it would not be um, possible <laughs> indeed thank you let's let's turn to some of the questions that have been coming in online uh, picking up on a theme we started with publication um, Sasan al Kawas would be interested to know whether you think impact factors, in, in publication have a negative impact on innovation and finding new solutions? Yes, yeah, surely it's a very interesting question and my uh, answer is yes. And uh, relating to what uh, I said at the beginning of the discussion, um, I, I can really say this because I am a macrobiologist and um, these uh, impact factors uh, are also the, the reasons why uh, there will be less um, Macrobiologists in the academic field in the future, uh, which is kind of uh, very worrying, uh, taking into account uh, the, the obvious threat. I think uh, uh, it, it seems like everyone around the planet has, has understood by now uh, the, the impact uh, that uh, a new virus infection may have, uh, a new virus uh, against which we don't have a vaccine at first. And thanks. This where was a, a, a virus for which, uh, like a lot of viruses, there is this vaccine strategy, and in this case, also the, the possibility to to develop very fast, very very fast uh, vaccines, which will not be the case for bacteria, bacterial infections, whereby the production of vaccines is way uh, longer, uh, as well as also um, uh, the, the the production of antibiotics that is even more cumbersome. And so this is a roaring that I have, and I will not put it as a cause, uh, I mean, the, the reason why uh, uh, we have less uh, young scientists interested in macrobiology and in staying in the macrobiology field, uh, that it's only the impact factors that are the cause. But in a way, yes, because the selections of group leaders, let's face it, are based on whether I mean, uh, selections of, of young scientists towards, you know, group leader and mm -hmm. career are always based as, uh, upon whether they have a nature or science paper or a cell paper. And in macrobiology, it's, it's, it's more difficult. Hmm. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we, let's go back to the auditorium for another question. Hello. Um, I'm a first year medical student, so I still have a long way to go, but uh, I would like to ask a question about CRISPR regarding um, the development, instead of developing treatment, some people or some researchers are thinking about editing genes that are already uh, healthy in order to develop, uh, how can I say it, uh, design humans the way they want, for example, give blue eyes or whatever, and uh, some people are having concern about this. So uh, what do you think about it? Do you think it could have a future prospect? And uh, does it have, uh, and would it have any negative impacts on like biodiversity or perhaps um, um, racial inequality and so? So yeah, uh, that's another aspect people are thinking about and I wanted to know what you think about it. 
Uh, yes, so for sure, it's uh, it's uh, an aspect of the um, technology application that is of of, of great concern. Um, the idea to use uh, genetics for human transformation is actually not novel because even at the beginning of the 70s, when uh, those um, molecular biology technologies appear and those that uh, would be very useful for genetics, there was already the idea that you know along the way those technology could be used for animal or, or human transformation. Um, um, now the the Beyond human transformation, that is blue eyes, etc., which I believe is not the the the, you know, the 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 application that CRISPR-Cas should have, and I'm not completely sure that it will have in the sense that um, to apply the the, the technology uh, in the human germline, it requires a lot a lot of preciseness and. And, and controls, which I'm even not sure whether the CRISPR-Cas technology, in principle, would um, you know would reach this preciseness, um, and you know, and all the controls you have to do around. But let's say even if it was uh, possible and shown to be uh, possible to do it in a, in a very uh, precise manner, uh, there are some ethical issues and, uh, and among. Uh, number of, of scientists thinking that uh, the, the technology should not be used for this. Now, what you mentioned is whether it could be used to prevent. So um, the idea being that maybe, uh, um, you know, the plants know that they carry mutations that uh, could uh, also be carried on. And so the idea to uh, somehow correct uh, certain types of, of mutations, but uh, again, uh, uh, in the human germline, it it is very uh, not conceivable even now after ten years to think that the technology could be used to to to, uh, to target and 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 cure in a way uh, more than one gene at a time, and then uh, you have also other technologies that are are used. That is, you know, the selection of of uh, very early on of embryos uh, that are counter selected for a certain mutation. That here does not require any genetic manipulation, um, but just a selection of, of embryos, which are uh, you know um, happening in, in certain countries. So uh, that's why I'm not sure whether, in any case, the CRISPR-Cas technology will bring anything. And I'm nevertheless among <laughs> the people as well who believe that it's a bit dangerous to to use the technology for this even this um, curing. Uh, very early curing, um, um, you know, matters. Uh, so that is my my point of view. Uh, it is possible in the future uh, that uh, this will be um, maybe the technology sees some progress in this regard. That maybe in the future we will see uh, curing of of certain genes at the level of the human germline. Um, but um, yes, I have some, some uh, let's say, um, yeah, some some concerns in this regard. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're really running out of time, but let's just try and squeeze in a couple of quick questions with a couple of quick answers. A very big question for, for a short answer from Fahano, who says you're an inspiration to female scientists around the globe female professionals indeed around the globe. What do you think can be done to support women in science or should be done? Um, I think that, the, first of all, I think it's important that the women support themselves. <laughs> um, now, you know, I can, I can it, it's an interesting topic and I could speak for long hours on this topic. Um, interestingly speaking, at least I can see it in, in Germany or in, uh, you know, the, the, in, in Europe, um, now, research is not only a concern in, in uh, women for a career, it's also a concern for men because mentalities are a bit changed and the, the young uh, European males uh, want to spend more time with their family. Uh, they think more of the so-called work-life balance, but for me, I think life is work, so <laughs> the balance is through work. <laughs> but, but having said this, it's, it ended up actually being a concern also for 
for young, um, you know, young men, uh, I have to say. Now, for sure, uh, you know, during my career, I always felt that I always uh, understood the, the, the multiple occasions where I understood that obviously I was a woman because things were maybe not uh, happening the way, uh, you know, it could have happened. And I, I would always, you know, what saved me um, uh, during my journey is just to to just be professional, actually focus on the fact that I was a scientist. Uh, I think you have a lot of efforts nowadays to support women, I have to say, at least in Europe. Um, also, um, I think it's it's also clear if you look at, uh, you know, education, uh, maybe women are more, uh, you know, tend to be more interested in also, uh, you know, research and education in our days. I feel uh, sorry to see a lot of young women uh, leaving the field, but it's also the case of men, but because they think it's going to be very difficult to to link a professional career in academia and, and uh, uh, family. Um, but I think again, and the only recommendation that uh, I would have is to, to really focus on the science actually, what has driven actually me was was uh, sometimes to not see too much left and right and to ignore certain situations and rather, um, you know, focus on what was my uh, ultimate goal, actually, which was initially very humble, was the fact that I just wanted to stay in academia. But And staying in academia often means that in all days that one has to have a, a career. And then it was, was a little bit fighting... Uh, through the path of, of staying at least uh, as long as I would wish in the academic system. But again, uh, there is not a, a recipe. Um, it's, it's also the journey is different from one person to another one because the, the, the conditions are always different. But um, I think as well that only the women themselves can also together. Sometimes the, the women don't support uh, enough one another and I think it's important that they support one another because the men have always a tendency to have their networkings but the the women have a tendency to not really have um you know their networking uh, or it's a networking focusing on women that may be against men which is not, not good neither so I think it's uh but the mixity is very good this is uh, my, my conclusion is always this you know mixity is very good and I think men realize now that it's also nice to work with women more and that, you know, you have different ways of thinking, different ways to approach. And in all days, internationality and mixity of gender is, is key actually for, for, you know, creativity, development and progress and innovation. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, let's give the last question. And we really have to stop in about two minutes, but uh, to, to a student in the auditoriums. Yes. I'm a third year biotechnology student, and my question was uh, that for you, what is the most important uh, limitations or unexplored areas of the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism that uh, today's generation of researchers could uh, build upon and explore further? Well, it's a challenging question because so many people have worked on, uh, on the new CRISPR-Cas system that have been discovered and that uh, and and the uh, deep understanding of the mechanism to uh, to harness uh, the mechanism as a tool so with all the new crispr cas uh, subsystem that have been discovered lately so i think it's yeah it's i mean there are, there is always research uh, that has to be done again it's related to what i said earlier um that is, you know, a, a tool always needs to be adopt, adapted to the type of cell and the type of DNA to be targeted. So there is always something to be done and there is still research going on, but then it's more to fine tune either the understanding of a mechanism of a specific CRISPR system or to fine tune uh, the, you know, the type of, of, of strategy um, that, uh, you know, where the, the CRISPR-Cas systems could, could um, play a, a role. Uh, I would say that if one wanted to discover something, you know, again, new will be uh, a search for a new CRISPR-Cas system that will not have been uh, discovered. And, and this can be only through 
the the sequencing of bacteria bacterial and archaeal isolates that are found uh, all over the world in the different environmental niches so uh, digging into finding new microorganisms always lead to the, uh, the the finding of new mechanisms so you have a lot a lot of of bacteria archaea and also viruses found in the sea that are still totally unknown in in terms of of uh, you know the identity of of their genes and this leads me to the fact that there are so many genes in bacteria and archaea and viruses and i mean uh, that are not known and also bacteriophages and this is a large source of new systems that are not crispr cas but are defense systems which uh, bacteria and archaea and also viruses have evolved because viruses have also certain types of viruses can be infected by other viruses and so have also evolved different systems <laughs> against viruses so this knowledge of really uh, the our ecosystem in a way uh, will only bring uh, new knowledge with new mechanisms that will be harnessed as new genetic tools. So there is a large source of, of mechanisms uh, to be uh, discovered and understood that will uh, add to the genetic toolbox that is already existing. Thank you. Once again, one never knows where curiosity will take you. Um, exactly. Uh, it was so exciting to um, have you here, Emmanuel, and to be joined by our online audience and the lovely audience in the auditorium at the University of Sharjah. I'm so sorry we have to stop, but we do now. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to be here. I'd like to thank the University of Sharjah for hosting us, for everybody for their questions, and particularly you, Emmanuel, for taking time out of your amazingly busy schedule to be with us. So thank you very much indeed on behalf of us all. Thank you, and I hope, because I never visited your country, so I hope to be able to visit uh, in some years from now and meet you in person. Thank you very much.